Trouble breathing, aches and pains. These are just some of the main symptoms of sarcoidosis, a rare inflammatory disease that develops when groups of cells in the immune system form into clumps. Diagnosing it can be challenging. Doctors kept telling me allergies, allergies, hair falling, different things like that for years. It's specialist after specialist after specialist. We'll identify the symptoms, causes, and complications, and why some people may be walking around with sarcoidosis and not even know it. It's all straight ahead in this week's Prescription for Life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Monica Robbins. Sarcoidosis can affect any organ, but cases are typically found in the lungs. The disease is much higher among African Americans and much more severe. In some cases, it can be life-threatening. Doctors say there is no known cause. However, it is believed that both genetics and environmental factors play a role. We'll get into that much more with our expert in just a moment. But first, an Illinois woman living in and out of hospital Hospitals, found a way to be a lifeline for others living with this disease. Devin Brooks has her story. The steps of life for 65-year-old Carol Miller are about putting one foot in front of the other. How's this feeling, Carol? Pretty good. Pretty good. Feeling good. Pretty good. Pretty How good. How short of breath are you feeling? Zero to ten. Carol's struggle to breathe is nothing new. For me personally, it is what it is. I live with it. It's one of the main symptoms of a disease called sarcoidosis, what Carol has. I've met so many people that have the disease, that know somebody that have it, and know somebody that has already died from complications from this disease. My people! One of them. When we gonna break, we break. The late legendary comedian Bernie Mac. The sarcoidosis had took a toll on him. I talked with his wife, Rhonda McCullough Gilmore. It is more common than you think. She says it led to lung problems further into his career. No matter how how bad he was uh, stricken with it, he always just kept positive and and he used to say. Uh, sarcoidosis don't have me, I got sarcoidosis, you know, and he would say, I'm just gonna keep on going. That fight from in his 20s up until 2008, dying at 50 years old. For many, many years, as I say, he went on to, to, to just live life and never had any issues with it. The same can't be said for Carol. Doctors kept telling me allergies, allergies, hair falling, different things like that for years. These were hives on her arms during our interview. She says it took roughly 20 years to get an accurate diagnosis of the problems. It's specialist after specialist after specialist. We need to keep an eye on it. Carol's doctor, Yudea Shrisha at Unity Point Health, says there's been a gap in understanding throughout the medical field. Because it's a rare disease, the diagnosis of it becomes challenging at times. This issue is common with rare diseases because we don't see it every very often. But the key... Are the symptoms persistent? Are the symptoms getting worse? I have GERD, I have heart disease, um, lung disease, COPD, um, scarring of the lungs due to the sarcoidosis. Some people feel so alone, you know. I just want to bring awareness so people have a better understanding and a little bit more empathy. And that starts at this table. Carol, turning her experiences into something more. I am so glad that you guys came tonight. She's launched a support group in the Quad Cities. This is for family, friends, caretakers, uh -huh. for anybody. It's been so many people in my sarcoidosis community. One minute you're here and the next minute you're gone. But through Carol's moves in life. Don't take your health lightly. This illness won't keep her from putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah, I just take it one day at a time. In Rock Island, Devin Brooks, WQAD News 8. Doctors say several other diseases can mimic the symptoms and signs of sarcoidosis. And our Cleveland Clinic expert is here to explain what you should look out for. 
Joining me now is Dr. Manuel Ribeiro, who is the head of Cleveland Clinic Sarcoidosis Center. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you for having me. All right, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. What is sarcoidosis? Yeah, so, so Monica, sarcoidosis is a disease uh, that causes inflammation in the body. And this inflammation can really last for years. So it's a chronic uh, 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 inflammation. Uh, what happens in patients who have sarcoidosis is the immune system is hyperactive, the immune system is hyperactive, and a lot of cells are getting together and forming this lump of cells called granulomas. And this granuloma is really the, the main feature in sarcoidosis. Of course, it's microscopic. We don't see this at naked eyes. We, we have to look under the microscope to see those granulomas, but they really seem to be the problem. And when they invade the, the, the organs, when they infiltrate the organs, the lung being the most common, that's when patients really develop issues and symptoms and problems from this disease. But it's really a problem with the immune system being hyperactive in those patients. So how common is it? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not that common, right? Uh, of course, in large centers, in large clinics, uh, we, we see a lot of patients with sarcoidosis, but they are kind of focused on those large centers. Uh, th there's a recent study here in the U.S. showing that the prevalence of sarcoidosis in the U.S. is 60 per 100,000 people. So that's about 200,000 people with sarcoidosis living in the U.S. It's right there the threshold of a rare disease. So, so it is really uncommon. So who's most at risk? There, there are uh, 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 certain groups of uh, people that are at risk. So, so th the first important thing to say is we know that sarcoidosis is probably, uh, it probably happens as a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors. So this seems really to be uh, uh, the best explanation of, of how sarcoidosis happened this day. So in folks that are genetic susceptible to having the disease and then they are exposed to a certain trigger in the environment, uh, those are the folks who develop the disease. So there are many, many studies showing that black patients have a higher prevalence of sarcoidosis. Uh, that's not the only group. So another group that has a higher risk of developing sarcoidosis is the Northern European, specifically the Scandinavian folks. So those are just a few of the groups that have a higher risk of having the disease. And um, uh, within the, the, the black patients, black women are actually shown to have three times the chance of having sarcoidosis compared to other people. So you talk about genetic factors, so obviously it can be passed down, but yeah. they have to be exposed to an environmental issue? Absolutely. So what kind of environmental issues are we talking about? Absolutely, and, and this is uh, one of the many unknowns in sarcoidosis. It is officially still a disease of unknown cause. We haven't been able to pinpoint a specific trigger, a specific cause of sarcoidosis. In fact, the best theory nowadays is that there are many potential triggers, and then in those folks that are susceptible to that trigger, they develop the disease. So there, there are some potential triggers out there. Again, nothing is really uh, known for certain, uh, but mold, fungi, some specific type of bacteria, so some types of infections are thought to be potential triggers for sarcoidosis. Uh, exposed to metals, for example, certain metals uh, have been uh, linked to sarcoidosis as well. Um, uh, uh, dust, smoke, so firefighters, for example, they have a higher incidence of having sarcoidosis because of that exposure to the, uh, uh, to the smoke. Uh, so those are just a few of the potential triggers. But again, we are probably dealing with many, many potential triggers that are specific to each, to each patient. So what are the signs? What are the symptoms? Yeah, so, so it really depends on what organs are involved. Sarcoidosis can affect any part of someone's body. The most common location affected is the lung. So because the lung is affected in, again, 90% of patients with sarcoidosis, lung problems are the main, the main symptoms and signs. So cough, specifically a dry cough that lasts for many, many months, shortness of breath, those will be some of the most common symptoms uh, of patients with sarcoidosis. 
But again, any other organ can, can be affected. The skin is very frequently affected by sarcoidosis. So skin rash on face, arms, legs, trunk, uh, any area of the body uh, patients can have uh, this skin rash. Sarcoidosis can affect the eyes, causes inflammation in the eye, either in front of the eye or in the back of the eye. So you can have redness, for example, dry eyes. Um, and again, depending on where you have the disease, the symptom can be completely different. So these symptoms sound like m something most people would deal with and they wouldn't even notice. When, yes. when do these symptoms get bad enough that you need to seek medical care? And yeah. since it's not that common, yeah. how do you test for it? Absolutely, so this is a very important issue in sarcoidosis. A again, there are studies showing that the average time between the symptom initiation and the diagnosis is about two years. So some patients are walking around for two plus years <clears throat> with symptoms of sarcoidosis and they don't know that they have the disease. Um, and uh, partially it's because those symptoms are common in other issues too, right? So cough, shortness of breath, a lot of other uh, diseases, a lot of other problems can cause this. So people don't usually associate with sarcoidosis from the get-go. Uh, and then partially because it's still an uncommon rare disease that not everybody knows about. Um, I think what we, what we tell patients is uh, any symptoms that get, their, get them really concerned or that last for too long, you know, like two, three, four weeks with a cough, that's, that's not normal, right? So anytime that they have those, those issues, they have to seek medical attention, talk to their doctors and, and, and you know, and, and hopefully if they have sarcoidosis, the diagnosis will be made early. So what is the test? Like, how do you, how do you diagnose sarcoidosis? Yeah, so it, it depends a little bit on how, how they present. Uh, most patients will present with some lung symptoms, with some lung problems. So most of the time we are doing chest x-rays, CT scans of the chest. Uh, uh, things to look at the lungs a little bit better and trying to see if we see signs of sarcoidosis. If we do, if we do see signs that are suggestive of sarcoidosis, most of the time we need a biopsy. And that's an important message to patients as well uh, and physicians taking care of patients with sarcoidosis that most of the time we will need a biopsy to uh, get small pieces of the lungs, for example, look under the microscope and then try to see those granulomas, those lumps of cells from the immune system that are the cause of the disease. So if there's something that shows up on the x-ray, is it most common misdiagnosed as perhaps lung cancer? Absolutely, so lung cancer is a common misdiagnosis, lymphoma. A lot of our patients, they come and they were told they had lymphoma until they do the biopsy and they realize that they have sarcoidosis, uh, pneumonia, uh, tuberculosis present in a similar way. So there are a lot of diseases that are more common than sarcoidosis that ended up getting uh, 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 misdiagnosed and you know, insert a little confusion in that diagnostic process there. So some of the people who may have been diagnosed with one of those things, mm -hmm. should they get a second opinion to make sure it's not something, if they know they may have a genetic risk factor? Yeah, so sometimes, yes. Sometimes they do uh, need to either get a second opinion or, or go to the same healthcare provider, but, but ask, is this really this disease? Um, usually what we do is, let's say if they get another diagnosis of an infection, a pneumonia or lymphoma, if things respond well to treatment, right? If they get better quickly, if they respond to the, to the, to the cancer treatment or to the pneumonia treatment, then it's probably because the diagnosis was correct. But if something is uh, unusual, if the, if the response to the treatment is not uh, as expected, that's when folks, patients and physicians need to start thinking, is this really an infection? Maybe this is sarcoidosis. And that's usually, usually how it happens. So what's the treatment for sarcoidosis? Yeah, so going back to one of the main issues, right, which is the immune system being hyperactive, the main treatment is to use medications to suppress the immune system. The one that we tried most of the time is prednisone, steroids. But we have to be very careful because we have to try for a short period of time using the lowest dose possible because we know that sometimes the treatment can be worse than the disease. The, the side effects of prednisone, if any patient has been on prednisone, they know this really well. 
uh, the side effects of prednisone can be worse than the disease. So uh, yes, it's an important medication to, to use in the beginning of the uh, manifestation of the disease process, but we, we, gotta, we gotta be very careful. So that's why um, a lot of times in many patients, and sometimes even early in the disease process, we have to consider alternative, uh, alternative medications to, the, to prednisone, we call those steroid sparing agents or second line agents, third line agents. Some common names are methotrexate. That's a disease that a lot of my patients ask, is this a cancer drug? And it is because it is used to treat cancer, but in much higher doses, it is also very important in sarcoidosis. There's another medication called infliximab. That's an infusion medication that they can get in an infusion center, very strong medication to treat sarcoidosis, but very effective in some severe cases, and it allows us to use less steroids, less prednisone, which I think it's a very important thing. So do any of these medications actually break up the granulomas? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the ultimate goal, is to really break up those granulomas, prevent more granulomas from forming, and by doing that, improving the function of the organ, and most importantly, actually make patients feel better. That's really the ultimate goal in sarcoidosis, is to make patients feel better. Sarcoidosis, a lot of times, causes um, uh, symptoms that are significantly affecting the patient's quality of life, and uh, sometimes the tests actually look pretty good. Chest X-ray may be normal, pulmonary function tests may be normal, the patient feels horrible. So we gotta focus on how they feel. We gotta use those medications to try to make them feel better. And this is really the ultimate goal in this disease. So you talked about the lungs being the most common place yeah. and obviously a dry cough would be that symptom. Correct. But if it can affect other organs, are the symptoms different? Yes, so the symptoms, uh, the symptoms are different. Uh, we talked a little bit already about the skin and the, the eyes because they are common ones, but uh, the heart can be affected in sarcoidosis, not that commonly. There's a study showing that about 5% of patients with sarcoidosis will have a significant issue from cardiac sarcoidosis, from sarcoidosis in the heart. But it is the heart, so it is important. We gotta, we gotta pay attention to that. So we always ask our patients about heart symptoms. The most important one is palpitations, feeling their heart beating too fast or too slow, skipping a beat, a little flutter in the chest. This can be a sign of sarcoidosis in the heart. Of course, palpitations is, is common in other situations too, and sometimes it's related to anxiety or not related to any disease. So it's not just one episode of palpitation that gets us concerned, but if a patient has a palpitation that lasts for more than two weeks, for example, and we can't explain by other features, this can be sarcoidosis. If a patient is passing out for no reason, right, with no easy explanation for that episode of passing out or syncope, that also is a major concern for sarcoidosis in your heart. So. Uh, that, that's one that we really pay extra attention to. You talked about the environmental triggers yeah. being an aspect to this. Um, it sounds like it's manageable with medication, mm -hmm. but are there other things that could trigger it or that patients need to avoid? Yeah, so, so we, um, again, there's not much that we know for sure about those triggers, but there, there are a few things that we think may either trigger sarcoidosis or make sarcoidosis worse. Like in a patient with sarcoidosis, there are a few things that may trigger a flare of the disease. Um, stress, stressful situations, right? So, so we have to always be talking to our patients about this, uh, learn how to manage stress better because this can uh, 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 trigger a flare or make those flares more common. Um, some patients do notice a pattern with food, specific types of food that they eat. This is not universal. This is not necessarily proven yet, but it's definitely a pattern that we see in some patients. They have to watch what they eat because a few things can flare up the disease. Uh, infections, right? So they may get a simple cold or the flu uh, or COVID, for example, and this can trigger a flare of the sarcoidosis. So we have to watch, watch for that too. So what's your advice to patients? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I think um, in patients who don't know that they have sarcoidosis, right? They just got to be aware that that's an important condition. And, and if, for example, they have a dry cough that, again, lasts more than a month to three months, uh, or if they are, you know, it, it, one of those risk groups, uh, you know, like black patients, Northern Europeans, Scandinavians, if they have those symptoms that nobody is really figuring out, it's an important question to ask to the physicians, you know, can I have sarcoidosis? If they have a family member with sarcoidosis, um, that increases a little bit the, the risk of them having sarcoidosis them themselves. So if they have a family member with sarcoid, uh, they should also point that out to the physicians, right, to the healthcare providers. Um, and this, I think, will increase awareness about that, that possibility. Uh, so those are for, for folks that don't know that if they have sarcoidosis or not. If they do know that they have sarcoidosis, then it's really about uh, building that relationship with the healthcare team, right? Uh, so, so the healthcare providers uh, are here to help, and 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 one of the main things that we try to do really is to listen to their issues, listen to their problems, understand their goals, their preferences, and that communication really needs to happen because. Sarcoidosis can be very different depending on, on which patient is experiencing that disease. So we have to tailor the treatment for each one, right? So some patients need that prednisone. Some patients tell me, I don't want prednisone at all. So we have to avoid that. And only having that conversation, uh, being open about the disease, about their symptoms, reading about the disease, asking questions. I mean, those are things that, that are important. Are there certain medications that can lead to this or even cause it? Yes, absolutely. So there are uh, medications that can trigger what we call a sarcoidosis-like reaction. Uh, we don't know if it's really sarcoidosis, the disease, or just a reaction that is similar to that. Uh, and one of the most interesting ones is that infliximab that I mentioned, for example, that's an important class of medication to, to treat sarcoidosis. In rare cases, they can actually trigger the disease. So we gotta be attention to that. Some patients, they are using those medications for something else, like rheumatoid arthritis, and they may develop a sarcoidosis-like reaction to those drugs. We don't understand necessarily why, but definitely something that we need to watch for. But if you stop taking them, does it go away? Yeah, usually if it's related to or caused by one of those medications, one of the first things that we do is we stop it. Most of the time, the disease gets better on its own. Sometimes we need to add some other medications to, to keep it under control. Is it, does it potentially have the ability to become fatal if you don't treat it or even on treatment? Can it get worse? Yes, yeah, so, so it can. Uh, sarcoidosis can be fatal. Uh, uh, thankfully, most patients do well. Uh, only about half of the patients actually need treatment for sarcoidosis. So in about 50% of the time, we can just watch and the disease either stays stable or gets better after a few years. Um, but again, half of, those, half of those patients will need some treatment. And about two thirds, you know, 60, 70% of patients will have a more benign course. And again, the disease will either remain stable or even go away after a few years. About 10, 20, 30 percent, depending on which study you look at, uh, you know, about a third of the patients can develop a more chronic uh, uh, disease process, a more severe disease process, and some patients, unfortunately, can die from that, especially if, if they have a more severe form of pulmonary sarcoidosis. So if they have scar tissue in the lungs, this is one of the, the most fatal forms of sarcoidosis. But the most important thing is be aware of it and ask questions. Absolutely, I think asking questions to your healthcare team, that's, that's one of the most important thing, yeah. Dr. Rivera, thank you so much for your insight, so valuable. Thank you, Monica, my pleasure. Yeah. That'll do it for this edition of Prescription for Life. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back here next week with another dose. Until then, I'm Monica Robbins, wishing you and yours good health.